Hi, my name is Rhonda Fuelberth, and I'm an Associate Professor of Music Education here at the Glencorf School of Music at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Today we're going to talk about universal design for learning and its implications for music education classrooms. Uh, Franklin Covey speaks to us in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People about beginning with the end in mind. And because of that, we're going to be thinking about a classroom. So I want you to imagine a classroom where equity is commonplace, where students are treated as people and not as labels, where all students have access to high quality, engaging music and arts instruction, where all students feel valued, where all students' strengths are recognized, and where teachers, students, and peers are partners in creating and problem solving. Universal design came to us from the architectural world, um, beginning with the civil rights movement in the 1960s and the disability rights movement in the 70s, 80s, and 90s we have found a way to give access to more buildings and more structures than ever before. Uh, think about things that you use in your everyday life, uh, whether you are carrying an instrument and push a button to move you and all of your instruments and bags through the door, um, that is an example of universal design in architecture. Or using curb cutouts at every intersection or pulling along a suitcase as you navigate an airport, or pushing a baby in a stroller. All of these are examples of ways that we make everyday tasks and activities more accessible. In Architecture Without Barriers, Joan Searless tells us the focus of universal design is not on providing special segregated facilities, ramps, or lifts for physically disabled persons to enter and use the built environment, but rather seeking to provide an inclusive environment that considers the potential ability of all people through the creation of products and environments that everyone can use, regardless of age, physique, and degree of disability. As we think about this universal design and make application to education, we think about structures that anticipate individuals with various needs, and we accommodate those needs at the outset. When we apply that to education, we think about proactive principles and strategies, techniques for creating inclusive classrooms and accessible course materials. At its core is the assertion that when instructors increase the number of learning options available to students, everyone benefits. This represents a paradigm shift in the way that we think about accessibility in education. In our previous model, in terms of accessibility, we ask what does the student provide or have that makes coursework accessible? We moved from thinking about accommodations or adaptations or modifications to what we might do for an entire classroom to make learning more accessible for everyone. This makes us shift from our focus on one student who may need a particular set of variances in our instructional technique to small groups or even to the entire class. One thing is constant. And this is the most important thing to remember. We will always have learner variability. Universal Design for Learning uh, was established by the CAST organization, and it has been with us for quite some time. It's based on the science of neural networks. We have recognition networks, the what of learning, how we gather facts or organize what we see or hear or read, to strategic networks, the how of learning, planning or performing tasks, how we organize or express our ideas, and affective networks, or the why of learning, how learners get engaged and how we can keep them engaged in the learning process. Universal Design for Learning includes a set of three principles, a set of guidelines to accompany those principles and strategies to help us carry out those guidelines. Principle one, to support recognition learning, we provide multiple flexible methods of presentation. Principle two, to support strategic learning, we provide multiple flexible methods of expression and apprenticeship. In other words, we vary the way that students can show us what they know. 
In principle three, to support affective learning, we provide multiple flexible options for engagement. This is the motivation principle and concerns how students are encouraged to continue learning. Principle one is to vary modes of presentation, how we're presenting material to students. We think about materials that are student-centered in this approach. Everything that is spoken should be reinforced in print, and everything that is in print should also be spoken. The idea of repetition and redundancy is very important, and not just repetition, but varied repet repetition to allow for multiple opportunities to learn. Pre-teaching is very important, providing recordings or exposure to musical materials before they're encountered in the classroom can be the difference between a student having a meaningful experience and not having a meaningful experience in the music classroom. Use of digital materials is very important. In fact, it's a central component of universal design for learning. And we always want to encourage uh, activities that are multi-level and multi-sensory. Principle two, methods of expression. This principle has to do with students showing us what they know. We want to give students options for demonstrating their understanding of musical concepts. We want to provide plenty of opportunities for students to sing, to play, to move, to improvise, and to compose. Also in this principle, uh, we have a lot of self and peer evaluation, opportunities for students to examine their own musical learning. Continuous assessment is also important, continuous and low stakes assessment. Students have many opportunities for feedback from teachers, from peers, and their own feedback is essential in this principle. Graphic organizers can be a way for students to show what they know in a different format than is customarily found in music classrooms. Principle three, meaningful experiences. We want every student to have a meaningful experience in music classrooms. Whether this is offering choices of content and materials, offering adjustable levels of challenge, offering choices in terms of rewards, or offering choices in the learning context. We're trying to see if we can help students be motivated in their learning. We'll focus for a moment on principle one, to support recognition learning, multiple flexible methods of presentation. I'll give you a few examples of how this might be played out in a classroom, both of these using digital materials. In this solfege activity, we see a line on the slide that represents the melodic contour of a warm-up that we might typically find in a choral rehearsal. First, we'll ask students to shape that contour, and we'll go a little further and imagine that they're carrying or holding a paintbrush in their hand. We might vary even the size or the way that that paintbrush works, but we will see that uh, melodic contour followed. Do, do, so, do, mi, fa, re, mi, so, la, so, so, do, do, ti, do. On the next slide, we'll see the solfege syllables graphically represented so that they demonstrate how low or how high the pitch is. I'll also reinforce that with some hand signs. Do, do, so, do, mi, fa, re, mi, so, la, so, so, do, do, ti, do. On the next slide, we see a combination of those representations, and then we reinforce that with a picture image of those uh, hand signs so that students can go ahead and practice and we can manipulate those materials. Note flight is another one of these digital tools that can help us manipulate musical materials. Students can interact with Note flight with a free account. They can access a teacher's examples and can manipulate these materials in real time. The added benefit is the use of color-coded notation. We'll include a few examples here, and you can see that every pitch is represented by a particular color. 
Sometimes a musical staff can be very complicated to negotiate and to interpret. And so always having that color reinforcement, say, of do and so, always coming back to that uh, anchor, those anchor pitches can be very helpful for students. They can manipulate these musical materials to isolate one particular musical line. They can also slow the tempo without altering pitch. And you can even have a video recording timed on the bottom of the screen so that you can help reinforce those ideas of pitch and um, hand sign solfege. In conclusion, if universal design for learning becomes a process, very few additional accommodations or modifications will need to be made. When we have a student come to us with a greater set of needs, we can problem solve and think about strategies that will allow for meaningful access to musical materials in the classroom. Think about moving into this profession. You're now a student and thinking about your role as educator. How do you see examples of universal design being used in your day-to-day -day experience as a college student? How would you envision universal design allowing you to reach more learners more of the time? Thanks for watching today. Please contact me if you have any questions.